Good evening and welcome to Southern Hills this evening. We do want to extend a special welcome to all of our guests and visitors tonight. Um, a few announcements before we begin our services. We do have our guest speaker with us tonight, David Shannon from Freed Hardeman University. At the appropriate time, Steve Ellis will, will give a better introduction to uh, President Shannon. Um, I hope everyone had a chance to pick up a bulletin this morning. If not, there's still several copies left back in the back foyer. Uh, we want to extend our sympathy to David T. Sweeney on the passing of his mother, Clara Sweeney. And the funeral arrangements are at Williamson Memorial tomorrow at noon with visitation starting at 10. Um, as I announced, the presidential, David Shannon will be here tonight to, to bring our message to us. And also the uh, holiday party for our ninth and up is tonight after services. We'll be taking the van over to the Brooms house and then we'll be returning with the van um, if your kids would like to ride that. And also our KFC has an outing tomorrow evening. Uh, see Cody, and, Cody or Nikki Lovett uh, for information about that. And December the 19th, I believe that's this Thursday, we have our youth holiday caroling um, starting at 530. Um, I was asked to announce that on Christmas Day we will not be having our services. We will be moving those to December the 26th, that next day, the, the Thursday, and the time will stay 7 o'clock. Uh, so just make a note of that and we'll try to get that in the, in the bulletins and everything so that we all are reminded of that. Those are the announcements that I have for tonight. If you would, bow with me in prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, we thank you for the day you've blessed us with. We're thankful for the opportunities that we have had to spend time gathered around your throne in worship to you. Father, we pray that everything that is said and done is done in accordance with your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening. Our first song is number 934. 934. <clears throat> Hosanna.
Our reading today will come from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Again, that is 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Jesus Christ, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, peace from the God, the Father, and Christ Jesus, your Lord. I thank God, who I assume, as my forefathers did, with a clear conscience as night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayer. Recalling your tears, I long to see you, so that I may be filled with joy. I have first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice's, and I am persuaded now live lives in you also. For this reason I remind you to fan your flame, the gift of God which is in your thoughts laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but of a spirit of power, of love, and self-discipline. Let's bow and pray. Lord, we come before you now and we thank you so much for this, this Lord's Day that you've given to us. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to worship you, to come together, to assemble, to edify one another, to sing praises to you, Lord. We thank you for all of those things. Uh, Lord, we ask you to please help those who are perhaps traveling in these next couple of weeks for the holidays. Lord, we ask you to please help uh, the students right now who are taking midterms. Uh, we thank you so much for uh, the weather that we've been having, Lord, and we thank you so much for your son who came to die for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our invitation song after Brother Shannon's lesson will be number 197. 197. And before he brings us our lesson, we'll sing 860. Please be standing. 860. Do so. Thank you for being here this evening. Our guest speaker is David Shannon. David is the president of Freed Hardeman University. If you don't know, David was born and raised in Brushy, Tennessee. If you don't know where that is, that's okay because there's probably not too many people in this audience that do. Uh, it's actually about halfway between Centerville and Hornwall off Highway 48. There's not much there. Uh, there's a beautiful white painted stone church building where the Lord's Church meets. There's the Freeman Lumber Company with a couple of warehouses on either side of the road and a few other houses. And about a mile back down towards Lewis County is the home of Roy and Clara Shannon, and that's where David was born and raised. So uh, we're glad to have him with us tonight. Uh, David uh, graduated from Freed Hardman with a degree in finance and Bible. Then he left and went to Long Island, New York, where he worked with the Timothy Hill Children's Home for a couple of years in that capacity. Then he moved back to Gadsden, Alabama, where he became the pulpit minister for the East Gadsden Church of Christ. After about eight or nine years there, he came back home to Tennessee to become the full-time preacher for the Mount Juliet Church of Christ in Mount Juliet, where he served for 18 years and then he was asked to go and serve as president for Freed Hardman, and he's been there a couple of years. 
He's married to the former Miss Tracy Barnes. He has, they have four children and two grandchildren, and he is a proud grandfather. Um, but at the heart of David Shannon is the heart of a servant. And he's always had a passion for young people. And he's always looked for a way to connect with young people. And the Board of Trustees made one of the most, I think, best decisions that they ever made when they asked David to go to Henderson and serve as a the president for Fried Hardeman. And he's been doing that now for, like I said, about two years. We're glad he's here tonight. If you are a student, I'll throw a quick plug in. If you are a student and you haven't made your decision about your higher education, please consider Fried Hardeman University. I promise you'll be taught how to live and how to make a living. So, uh, David, come preach the Lord's word to us. Good evening. It is great to be with you this evening in Southern Hills. Appreciate Steve, appreciate the, the kind introduction, and I appreciate uh, the many years that Steve and I have, have known each other going back to Alabama days. And it's good to see so many of you that uh, with past connections and present connections, it's just really uh, an honor to be with you tonight. Uh, keep your Bible open to 2 Timothy there, the first chapter. We're going to be studying the text that was capably read just a moment ago. You know, there are many things I'd love to say about Fried Hardeman. This time doesn't permit right now, but I just think about the different students uh, that, that are here tonight that are a part of Fried Hardeman or just graduated Friday night from Fried Hardeman, as Connor uh, did. Uh, perhaps the best thing that I can say about Fried Hardeman is just look at them and then imagine that uh, being a hundred times over. Um, several hundreds of times over, and it really is an amazing environment. Eighty, over 80% 80 of our students are members of the Lord's Church and have such a core group of a student body that truly loves the Lord, creates a really powerful environment. 100% of our faculty are faithful members of the Lord's Church. And so walking into every classroom and being taught a biblical worldview on every topic is, is really powerful. And so we are, we're thankful for um, bringing two things together, and that is Christian education. And we strive to have uh, education provided that is excellent. And so most of the professional schools, we have 100% acceptance rate, uh, whether it's law or optometry, probably 99% acceptance into pharmacy. And then, um, you know, veterinarian and, and, and med schools, the national averages are in the 60s percents on that, and we, we average 91%. And so we, we truly uh, seek uh, excellence in, in education and faithfulness uh, in, in our Christian walk, and, and blend those two together seamlessly is, is the goal. When I was at Fried Hardeman, uh, I did an internship out of state, and I lived with a Christian family. And on a particular morning, uh, the mother was doing what she did most mornings. She had several teenage sons, and she kind of served as almost a, a short order cook there. And her, her sons would pass through the kitchen, and she would ask them how they wanted their eggs fried or scrambled or whatever it might be. And at that particular moment, there was a 13-year-old at one end of the table and a 17-year-old at the other end, and both of them were well over six feet tall. Both would go on to play high-level collegiate football, and one would play in the NFL. And at that particular moment, I just happened to be getting something out of the refrigerator. And she answers the phone. And from her side of the conversation, you're not able to tell anything about what was being conversed about. Her answers were one word or either short phrases. Now, who's this? What happened? When? Where is he now? That kind of thing. She, she hangs up the phone. And she looks in the direction of her sons, and she says the name of one of their brothers. And she says, Dustin is dead. Now, this family had already had one teenage son to die. And so one of the, the brothers literally drops the utensil out of his mouth. Both of them chime in together saying, Mom, what happened? What happened to him? How'd he die? 
And she simply said, he's dead. But mom, how? What, what happened? Where is he? What happened? And now she looks at them and she says, your brother is dead spiritually. Now they loudly rebuked her. Mom, you scared us. We thought that you meant he'd really died. Why would you do that to us? To which she explained to them, your brother really is dead. Your brother is dead spiritually. Now, she's a great woman of faith and knows Scripture probably as well as almost any of us here. She knows the grace of God and the mercy of God always allows the prodigal to return as long as the Lord hasn't come again and there's life in his body. She knows all of that, and I'm sure that's a part of her daily prayer. A few weeks later, I was riding with her, and so I asked her, I said, you've had a son to die physically that was such a faithful Christian. And now you have a son who's doing well physically, but he is dead spiritually. Which one is harder? And without any hesitation, she said, it's so much harder to watch my son who has died spiritually. She said, because I know that I'm going to spend an eternity with my son who has passed on physically. It's hard to think about my son being separated from the Lord forever. Tonight, I ask you, how do you view spiritual death? Now, I'm not asking you what's your view about it. I'm assuming that if you're here tonight on a Sunday night, you probably believe that there is a reality of spiritual death. But I'm asking you, what's your view toward it? How much does it bother you? What if we had every other young person to die physically? How long would it take us to put our foot down and say, we have to do something? We have to stop all of these, these senseless and needless deaths. Somebody has to do something. I simply ask you, where's the uprising in the spiritual deaths? We don't know how many of the Lord's church, the young people, they fall away. Some studies would say 40%. Some would go ahead and say 60%. We assume it's somewhere around the 40 to 50% fall away after high school. If you were to ask me what is one of the greatest challenges that the Lord's church faces today, I would say that my greatest concern facing the Lord's church today is faith after high school. We are struggling to have faith after high school. Look at your graduates 12 months after the night they graduate from high school. Where will they be in the next 12 months? Statistically, that is the most difficult year in the life of a Christian in North America. I don't know if it's true around the world. But here in America, we don't do 18 to 19 very well. We don't do 19, 20, 21, 22, 23 very well as Christians. And so what could we do? You know, we tend to take things to extremes. It, it seems to be our human nature. And so one extreme would be, well, let's make everything about this generation. This generation is Generation Z. So let's, let's figure out how they think, how they tick, how they process, what motivates them, how they learn. And let's make sure that as a church family, we do everything to focus on them. But there's a problem with that. Any generation of the Lord's church that marries one generation becomes a widow to the next. It never was God's design or plan for his church to be a one-generation church. As a matter of fact, out of all the beautiful descriptions that we see of the Lord's church, we see that it teaches just the opposite. When he taught that the church was a body and compared it to a human physical body, the whole emphasis in that was that every member is important. It doesn't matter if you're in your 70s, 80s, or 90s, or if you're in your teens or 20s. Every member is important. Or what about, what about the description where we are called the household of God? God calls us family. In other words, when the apostles came to Jesus and said, teach us to pray, 
You remember how he began addressing God? Our Father who art in heaven. And when Scripture refers to us toward each other, we're called brethren. As a matter of fact, we're so much like family. When Paul taught Timothy how to view older women, he said, in the church you view them like mothers. And older men, you view them like fathers. And peers, you view them like sisters and brothers. In other words, God's description and even the teaching through the Apostle Paul was, we're family. What do we know about healthy families? Healthy families are made up of every generation and every generation lovingly cares for each other. Now, I... I need to update something that's out there somewhere because instead of two grandchildren, I now have four grandchildren because I've had two born in this last year. Now, I want you to imagine that you come up to me after church and you say, hey, so you have four grandchildren. And I say to you, I, I think that's right. And you say, what, what's their names? And I say, oh, you know, I always struggle on that. I, I have a hard time, I have a hard time remembering. I wish, I wish my wife was here so I, could, so I could remember their names. Well, where do they live? You know, I can never remember. I, I don't, I'm not for sure where they live. What do they love to do? How am I supposed to know what they love to do? They're almost 50 years younger than me. How am I supposed to know what they like to do? You would leave that conversation and you would say, that guy's crazy. <laughs> now, the reason you do that is because that, that bleeds of unhealthiness. It would be so unusual. But now let's think about the Lord's church. How many of us could say, how am I supposed to know their name? They're a teenager and I don't have any teenagers in this congregation. Now pause there for a moment. Do you or do you not? You see, the way you answered that without thinking in depth shows whether or not you really see yourself as a family. If you said to yourself, I don't have any teenagers here, that's what we're speaking to tonight. Everybody here, if you're a part of this congregation, you have several teenagers. The question is, do you know them? Do they know you because of the way you love them? Because of the way you care for them? Because here's what's going to happen. They're going to graduate from high school, and they're going to go through a season that about half of them will not make it and still be faithful to God. The ones that do make it, they're going to have relationships that stay in touch with them, connected to them. And even though they may be a few miles from here, there will be those that stay with them through that season of life. And those likely will be the 50% that make it. But we could change those numbers if everyone decided to focus on someone. What we're talking about tonight is not a program where you adopt someone for a month or for a semester or for a year. And what we're talking about tonight is not something you can get so excited about it that you say, I'll do this with every young person. What we're talking about tonight is something where you meet one or two, you get to know them, and you have a mindset that says, I'm going to walk through life with you. We're always going to stay connected. Where do you get an idea like that? We've already had it capably read about tonight. We're reading in Paul's last writing that we have of inspired writing. You remember the fourth chapter lets us know that Paul is waiting in some kind of prison. He's in chains. He is waiting to be executed. He writes this letter and he writes it to Timothy. And what we learn in the first eight verses here is that apparently Timothy is really struggling at this point. When they first met each other, Timothy was probably a teenager. You can go back to Acts, the 16th chapter, and you can see that meeting. The congregation, Paul was a missionary. He's on his second missionary journey. He passes through the home congregation of Timothy. The home congregation is bragging on him, just like you would do with these young people here. You can imagine Paul and, and some of you standing around. And you point at a young person, you say, oh, they are a fine young person. You ought to hear them teach a class. You ought to hear them lead a song. You ought to see the great faith. You ought to see the way they invite 
non-Christians to church, the way they care for souls. You ought to see them. Whatever was being said that day, they were saying that about Timothy. And you know what Acts 16, chapter verse 3 says? It says Paul wanted him to go with him on that trip. Paul was always thinking souls and growing the church. What's this congregation going to be in 20 years? I can tell you to some extent what it'll be. It'll be whatever emphasis you place upon teens and 20-somethings. That's how you know what your future is going to be. I'm not saying they're not a part of the church today. I'm just saying that's how you impact the future today and the future. And so now we're reading 2 Timothy. By this time, Timothy doesn't, uh, Paul doesn't do it in this passage, but in other passages, uh, even b- before this time period, he calls himself an aged man. So based on the, the, the years of age of that time period that were considered elderly, in a sense, Paul says, I'm an old man by now. He's reaching back now, not to a teenager. By this time, Timothy has become a successful missionary by his own right. But this time, Timothy is a successful preacher by his own right. Now you might say he's more like a middle age preacher. And so this older man is reaching back to this man that's still a season behind him in life. And he writes these words. And what I'd like for you to see that within these words, we see that they have a genuine relationship. And what's concerning to Paul is that Timothy has genuine faith. And so he talks to him also about genuine service. And he approaches the concerns and the fears that Timothy has to describe a genuine courage. Let's see what this looks like. If you will, look with me in verse 1. Again, you see that Paul identifies himself as the author. But then notice he writes in, in the second verse to Timothy, a beloved son. Now, why does he call him a beloved son? You remember that they had no relationship that we know of from a biological standpoint. There's no DNA connection there. So why does he call him a son? Do you have, do you have anyone that's not a part of your family that you're so close to them, when you go to introduce them, it's very hard for you to just say they're a friend? I, I think about a friend I have that I don't even think about it. It just comes out. When, when I introduce him, I say, I, you know, I say, this is his name. And, and I say, and uh, it's, it's a friend of mine. And he's like a brother to me. Paul is writing to Timothy instead of just saying Timothy. Or instead of calling him brother because they were brothers in Christ. What does he do? He calls him a son. Their relationship had grown and and matured because of the nurturing and the time and the investment by Paul and the willingness of Timothy, it had grown to the point that he looked at him as a son. But notice, it doesn't just say a son there. It says, beloved son. Beloved means to love much. In other words, he's writing, Timothy, my beloved son. And then we see really how genuine this relationship is. Look at verse 3 and 4 again. Notice the second half of 3 and going into 4. I'll start at the beginning of verse 3. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did, as without ceasing. I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy." Timothy, I want you to know that I remember you. And I never stop praying for you. Night and day, I pray for you. I really look forward to us spending time together. And by the way, I know what has been bringing tears to your eyes. In other words, that's why I've been praying so much for you. That's why I want to spend some time with you. I know what you're struggling with. Now I wonder if any of us this last month have prayed every day for someone who is a season or two behind us in life that's not related to us 
And the reason we've been praying for them by name every day is not because they're on a list that we have our prayer list and we want to remember to pray, but it's because they're on our heart. And we know what's been bringing tears to their eyes. And that's why we've been praying for them every day. Now, I'll just go ahead and say it. Someone says, you're kidding me. I'm 65 years old, and you really expect me to know what's been bringing tears to a teenager's eyes. And that's our point. That's our point. I'm 40 years old, and you expect me to know what, what, what teenagers are struggling with right now. And, and I don't have any teenagers here right now. How, how would I know? And that's our point. Isn't it interesting that Paul had such a relationship with Timothy that he knew what he was struggling with? And it was because of that relationship that knowledge was there. It was because of that relationship that care was there. It was because of that relationship that his prayers and his desire to see him was very, very genuine. You see, that's what we mean when, when I say that this is something that we can't say, well, I'll do this with 20 kids, 20 young people. We can't. But what if everybody here got to know one young person and walked with one? Then we could know what their struggles were and what their challenges were. Now, why is that important? Listen, it's important for today. But another reason it's very important is because when they go through that very difficult journey of, of, of leaving adolescence and moving into young adulthood and making sure they don't leave their faith behind through that journey, they need someone that has formed a strong enough relationship. Are you ready? To say what needs to be said and it be heard. You can't sit isolated from young people and decide to speak up only when they take a wrong turn. You walk through life with them. Your relationship that's genuine purchases the clout to then say something that will be heard. This passage is part of the proof of that. Let's read verse 5. Let's read verse 5. I ask you, what do you think it is? Because I'll be honest with you, for a lot of years, I'd read verse 5, and I wouldn't know exactly what to do because with verse 5, because it sounds like that Paul has just given Timothy a report of faith about his family, and to me it always seemed like if anybody would know what their faith was, Timothy would know it. And so what do you do with this verse when he says... Notice the sentence is continuing. He's talked about what's been bringing tears to his eyes and that he wants to be filled with joy. And so then he says in verse 5, When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that's in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and I am persuaded it's in you also. What is that? He, he's just writing a letter. And, oh, by the way, just want to remind you out, your faith is genuine, your mother's faith is genuine, your grandmother's faith is genuine. Or is there more happening here? What's really happening here? Have you ever had a time in your life? And usually it's a buildup of months and sometimes years. Have you ever had a time where it kind of starts to cave in? And maybe you find yourself looking at yourself in the mirror. Maybe you're just looking down at your hands and staring into the ground. And you say these words. How did I get here? I never thought I would be here. I don't know if all of us have had that experience, but I know a lot of us have. I would suggest to you that this was one of those times for the life of Timothy. The reason I say that is because in verse 6, which we've already had read for us tonight, where it was Paul's plea to stir up the gift. In other words, here is this, and I want you to keep in mind, here's this, quote, middle-aged preacher. And I put it in quotes because for that time period, he would have been a middle-aged preacher. We would have still think of him relatively young, but, but keep in mind, an, an old age in that day and time where it was in the, the, the mid-50s. And so now, here is this middle-aged preacher. And in verse 6, 
his mentor is having to urge him to stir up his spiritual gift. In other words, become zealous again. And in verse 7, he's saying to him, stop being afraid. That, that operation of fear, it didn't come from God. If it didn't come from God, where'd it come from? What does God give? Satan gives fear. What does God give? He gives us power. He empowers us to overcome what we face. He gives us love, and love from God is greater than anything that we face. And he gives us a sound mind. How many of us, whenever we, we become fearful, one of the things that just comes out of our minds, we say, I just don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. You know what God does? He gives us a sound mind. He helps us to think clearly. He helps us to know what to do. What's happening in the life of Timothy? I would suggest to you that right now in the life of Timothy, he is not believing in himself anymore in the sense of, I can make this journey. I can be faithful. I can persevere. I can endure. And so what's happening? He is beginning to move an arm's length away from, instead of a zealous ministry, he must have been slowing down in ministry. And all this was motivated with fear. And someone says, David, what makes you think that? Well, he in essence tells us that in verse 8. Look, if you will, in verse 8 with me. Notice what he says. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. <clears throat> I would suggest to you that if you could walk up to Timothy at the very time that this was written and then go back into the past five years and you could ask Timothy these two questions, it would probably reveal a lot to us about this text that's written here. One, let's walk up to Timothy five years prior to this and let's ask the simple question. Timothy? Will you ever be ashamed of the testimony of your Lord Jesus? And Timothy would probably say, are you asking me if I would be ashamed to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? The death, burial, and resurrection? The Christian life? No, I would never be ashamed of that. I mean, you realize I'm a preacher. You realize I'm a missionary. I travel around and I tell people about the Lord. You realize, I've, I've worked in Ephesus for quite a while now doing that very thing. I'm kind of confused by your questioning, why do you think I would ever be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord Jesus? Okay, that's good to hear, Timothy. I have a second question for you. Would you ever be ashamed of the Apostle Paul? You do know him, right? Would you ever be ashamed of him? Can you imagine Timothy saying, me be ashamed of Paul? Do you realize he's like a, a spiritual father to me? He's a mentor to me. If, if I were to make a list of people that's not only been good to me, but they've been very helpful to me in my life, do you realize that, that Paul would be on the top of that list? What would make you ever ask me, would I be ashamed of Paul? Now let's come back to this present time. Now imagine Timothy looking at himself and saying, how did you get here? I never thought I'd ever be ashamed to preach the gospel. Now when people ask me, wait a minute, aren't you the one that knows that apostle Paul? And I hesitate. Sometimes I'm afraid to say, yes. Because after all, he's being held right now waiting to be executed. Why? Because he's a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What am I? I'm a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What do they know about me? They know that I am not only one like Paul, but that we've been in this together. We've been partners in ministry, and I'm like a son to him. Timothy, what's happening to you? And I can just imagine, I can imagine at this time, Timothy probably would have been thinking, what's happening to me is that I'm doubting myself. I don't think I can ever be what I need to be at this point. I just always thought I could face death. 
I could die for the Lord. I could face the persecution, even if it moved to execution. And now, now that it seems like a possibility, I don't know. Now pause there for just a moment. Do you see now a reason why everyone needs those older than them that walks with them through difficult times? I hope the teenagers here, I hope you have the best Christian friends around you, but it's not enough. You need those that have walked ahead of you a season or two in life. You need those that can say, I've walked through that season. Let me tell you what happens next. Let me tell you how you can make this journey. And let me tell you this. I believe in you, even when you maybe do not believe in yourself. How powerful is it when someone knows you very well? They know your journey. They know what's been bringing tears to your eyes. And they still say, I know you can do this. Now, on a much, much less important analogy, but just to give you an analogy, I can't help but think about the time that shortly after Tracy and I got married, we got married right out of college, and, and shortly out of, uh, after that, we had a couple of babies, and uh, I was preaching at a small church, and we didn't have two nickels to rub together. Uh, we were buying diapers and formula, and uh, we had one car, not because it was convenient, but because we couldn't afford two cars. We never bought uh, any new clothing, not because we didn't want new clothing. We couldn't afford it. We never ate out except one dime a week. If we could afford it that week, we lived on peanuts. And I don't mean for a week or two. I mean for a while. It went against everything that I'd been raised to do because I'd been raised from the time I was a little boy. Every time, first you work hard, you make money, and every time you earn any money, you give the first portion to God, you save the next portion, and you live off the rest. Once our babies came, first portion went to God, and I didn't have anything to save. And that may not sound like a big deal to you, but that's the first time in my life that ever happened. And I thought, well, I'll do it for a month or two and, and we'll figure out a way. And I never could figure out a way. And we kept cutting and cutting. And I never could figure out a way because expenses kept going up. So finally, after about 18 months of this, I was really down. I lived out of state from my parents, but my parents were visiting on for a few days. Dad and I were riding down the road and I thought, I got to get this off my shoulders. And I dreaded telling him, but I couldn't stand it anymore. And I remember driving down the road. I remember saying, Dad, I feel really bad. He said, what's bothering you? And I said, I feel like I'm really messing up financially. He said, why is that? And so I just told him what I told you. And I really, truthfully expected him to look over and say, Son, you're going to have to figure something out. You can't keep living like that. And you know what he did instead? He smiled and he cut his head around. He said, son, you have two babies and a wife and you're just getting started in life. If you're paying your bills, I'd say you're doing pretty good. Just keep giving to God first and pay your bills. At that moment, a little bit of a a burden started to rise off of my shoulders. But here's the next thing I want you to see, and here's where it is, a season in life. You have to have those people in your life that they've already walked that season. And his very next, it was completing the same sentence. The end of that same sentence he said was, and, and son, it won't be much longer. And you'll get a raise, and you'll start having some relief, and you go right back to saving. It's just around the corner. Keep doing what you're doing. And you know what happened? It wasn't too long before I got a raise. Some expenses started to come down. And it happened exactly like he said. Now, do you know what verse 5 is about? He was, in a sense, giving a report of faith. But why was it important for Timothy to hear this report of faith? 
I suggest to you that it's very likely at this point Timothy was seeing himself as a man that didn't have enough faith to hang in there. I'm dealing with too much right now. I didn't know it was going to be this difficult. I mean, Paul, you're the great apostle, Paul. Of course you can make it. Of course you can be persecuted. Of course you can be executed. And you won't give up on your faith. But I don't have that kind of faith. And listen again what he says in verse 5. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you. I know about it. I saw it when I visited the first time and I met your grandmother Lois. What a great woman of faith. I met your mother Eunice. What a great mother of faith. They instilled the scriptures in you from the time you were a little boy. I have done mission work with you. I've traveled with you. I've seen you study with people. I've seen you pray with people. I've seen you pour out your heart and your life to God. I know the genuine faith that is in you. And he closes, he starts that verse by saying that and closes that verse by saying, again, I am persuaded it's in you also. As if to say, I know you don't see this right now. I've lived longer than you. I know you maybe a little better than you know yourself about this. I'm persuaded that same faith is in you. So now let's put this all in order in the lesson's yours. Timothy's probably struggling right now. And he has someone that has walked with him for years now. Their relationship is so real that he can say the hard things that need to be said. But he also can see the journey of life ahead of him and say the things that need to be said about what can be. And it sounds something like this. Timothy, my beloved son, I just wanted to write to you and let you know I remember you every day and every night and I don't ever stop praying for you. I can't wait to see you. I know what's been bringing tears to your eyes and instead I want you to be filled with joy. I know you're struggling. I know you're pulling back in your service. And I know fear is causing you to want to be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord and even of me and my sufferings in chains. Timothy, I want to tell you what I see. I see a man that has the faith that is needed. I believe in you. Go back to that foundation that your mother and your grandmother helped instill in you. Go back to your God. He didn't bring you that fear. He'll bring you power. He'll bring you love. And He'll bring you a sound mind. Don't pull away from ministry. Fan the flame. Become zealous again. Timothy, you can do this. I'm persuaded that same faith is in you. When we go through difficult days in our faith, and we don't have someone that can walk with us during those difficult times, Believing in us sometime when we don't believe in ourselves, and telling us a future that maybe we have no way of seeing because we haven't walked that journey yet. If we don't have that kind of love, we don't have that kind of support, we don't have those kind of relationships, we probably won't make it. There's not some kind of magic wand why some have faith after high school and some don't. And I'd suggest to you a big part of that is the relationships that young people have that are maintained during those sometimes trying times in life. Isn't it wonderful that God adopts us into a family where it doesn't matter what age you are, there's a place for you. 
It doesn't matter if you're among the oldest or the youngest. In God's family, you're going to be loved and you're going to be valued. And if it's truly God's family, you're going to be cared for. And if it's truly God's family, at the times you don't think you can do it yourself, you're going to have those around you that's going to help you during that time to help you see that there's more in you and your relationship with God than what you probably thought. So we're about to sing a song of encouragement. And if you're not a part of this family, could I kindly say to you, you're missing out on the most important family that has ever existed. It's God's family. He wants to adopt you. He wants you to have brothers and sisters that genuinely care for you. And He wants to spend an eternity with you. Are you a believer? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Are you willing to repent of sins? Will you confess before others that Jesus is the Son of God? And will you be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins? To come out of that watery grave of baptism, cleansed, adopted, having a wonderful family that now you get to serve with and to serve and to be a part of. Maybe you've begun that journey and along the way, maybe fear has paralyzed you. Maybe you've stiffed arm service. Maybe you've doubted your own faith. Maybe you've backed away from God. Maybe sin has separated you from God. Isn't tonight the perfect time to repent and come home? And you'll have a family that will surround you to believe in you. And to encourage you, not because of our own power, but because of the one who empowers us. If we can help you in any way, comes we stand as we sing. Be seated, please. If you aren't able to take the Lord's Supper this morning, you have that opportunity now. If you would, after each prayer, just raise your hand, and then ushers from the back will come and serve you. If you'd like to follow along, I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verses 23 through 29. Again, that is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23 through 29. For I receive from the Lord that which I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup in an unworthy manner 
will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, and eat and drinks, eat and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. I want to challenge each and every one of you at this time to just not the ones that are just partaking that have already that already partook this morning, but each and every one of you to take this time again to think back on the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and how it affects you today. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for letting us come on this first day of the week to praise your name. Lord, we're thankful for the sacrifice of your Son who is willing to go to the cross for us. We're thankful for this bread that represents his body that hung on that cross. Help us to take this in a manner well-pleasing in your sight. In your son's name I pray. Amen. Please raise your hand. Let's pray again. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for that sacrifice your son, for that blood that ran down his face from the crown of thorns, from his hands and from his feet, and from his side. We're thankful for that blood and how it cleanses us from our sins. Help us to take this in a manner well-pleasing in your sight. In your son's name I pray. Amen. aside from the Lord's Supper, we have an opportunity to give back a portion that is given to us. If you aren't able to give this morning, you have the opportunity now. Just raise your hand after this prayer and they'll come and serve you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are blessed in so many ways, not just spiritually, but physically. For the clothes on our backs, the roof over our head, and especially the material blessings. Please be with the funds that are collected today. Please be with the people who oversee them. Help them to make the right decisions in how to use these funds to further your kingdom. In your son's name I pray. Amen. Please raise your hand. We're thankful to our visitors once again for being with us here at Southern Hills. Let us get to know you afterward, if you would, please. Thank you, Brother David, for that lesson tonight. 
David, I assume, will be sticking around for a bit afterwards if you want to talk to him about Fried Hardeman, and I would think that he will certainly welcome your email or phone call if you have any questions that extend beyond his time here tonight. If you would please be standing, and we'll be dismissed in one final song, and then a prayer to follow. Number 598. Would you bow with me, please? Father, we're thankful for this day that you've blessed us with, with the opportunity that we've had to come here to worship you today. We are thankful for the avenue of prayer, uh, that we could bring our cares and petitions to you and have them uh, addressed by you. We are th so thankful for all the things that you bless us with, Father. We are thankful for the lessons that we've heard tonight. We pray that uh, you would help us, uh, all the members across all the generations of this church, to know one another, uh, to encourage one another, and to serve one another. We pray that you would bless all the uh, universities that are associated with our brotherhood, help them to continue to bless the lives of those students, uh, and have, help those students to go out to the world um, and make it a better place to bring more people to your kingdom. Father, we pray that you'd go with us as we go uh, back out into the world this week. Help us to serve those around us, help us to be a good example to those around us that they could see uh, your love for the world. Father, when we do fail you, we pray that you forgive us. And uh, when, uh, when we do come to the end of our lives, we pray that you would save us. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.